It's Wednesday, March 16th, and the time for your body this today morning news update. The Democratic Labour Party is now ready to review government's offer of two seats in the Senate following Monday's High Court ruling. Interim DLP President Steve Blackett said once the offer is formally made to the party, consideration would be given to accepting the offer and potentially choosing the senators. We stand in readiness uh, as a party to review the offer as a party. Uh, I said this before, uh, once the offer comes to the part, formally to the party, that the organs would assemble ourselves at, um, at George Street, and we will first consider the acceptance of the offer, and once we get the nod of the council of the party, we will put a process in place to set about identifying who those two senators Meanwhile, Blackett disclosed that the DLP is ready for a strong resurgence, revealing that internally its members have been hard at work. You would have noticed over this weekend we had we initiated a discussion on the estimates, the 2022-2023 estimates. We have also a novel position that we've taken. We're going to be responding tonight at 6 o'clock um, to the, the budget that was presented. Uh, yesterday by the Prime Minister. We are doing some other internal work which will soon be revealed. So uh, we have not um, been sitting to within our thumbs in, in this interim. We have been busy doing some uh, foundational work and some informational work. Private sector operators, especially those in the financial services sector, were not at all surprised of being at the target of a pandemic contribution levy. Word of this from Chairman of the Barbados Private Sector Association, Trisha Tannis, following the announcement in Monday's budget. But addressing a post-budget breakfast forum on Tuesday, hosted by the BCCI and PricewaterhouseCoopers, Tannis said sector operators were not keen on the levy being backdated. And that is something that is seen not to be as progressive as the tax itself. We all understand how, you know, how we have to hold hands and we have to walk through um, this crisis together however applying that tax, re tax retrospectively certainly is not sitting well with, with the sector though they understand that there's a contribution to be made to the overall to the overall, overall um, effort we have to be also very careful with our language um, describing the financial services sector as coming through the crisis unscathed I think we need to be careful not to imbibe a hostile um, and disingenuous view of the sector which as Professor Moore has, has, has outlined, life did not start in March 2020. Let us please remember that. It did not start in March 2020. Um, he's being very generous by saying that from 2018, the economy was in decline. For those of us in practice in the private sector, it has been a decade or more of austerity. Let us not forget that. The story didn't start two years ago. The private sector in Barbados across multiple sectors has been in dire straits for well over a decade. The 1% tax for workers will take effect on April 1st, while the 15% tax on companies will be for the financial years ending March 2021 and 2022. Regional Economic Advisor Mala Dukaran, who also addressed the forum, gave her assessment of the pandemic contribution levy. I think this levy of 15% on certain sectors to help defray the cost of the pandemic is reasonable, especially since the sectors identified are largely profitable and non-Indigenous to Barbados. However, the pandemic contribution levy of 1% on anyone earning 6250 or more per month strikes me as a regressive tax. In my view, the threshold to qualify for this tax should have been higher and it should have been structured progressively, meaning a higher tax rate, the higher your income level. Furthermore, I would have liked to see more progressive income taxes overall, a higher personal, personal allowance maybe, and a tiered tax structure such that, as I mentioned earlier, higher income earners pay a higher tax rate instead of a flat rate for everyone.
Consumers may still have to bear the cost of rising fuel prices originating on the world market, even if the Fair Trading Commission were to reject the Barbados Light and Power Company's current request for a rate increase. Chief Executive Officer of the Fair Trading Commission, Marsha Atherley Aikichi, said the BLNP's application does not require the utility regulator to make a determination on fuel costs to consumers. Emmanuel Joseph tells us more. Athelia Kishi has, however, given the assurance that the FTC can ensure that the power company is using its fuel in such a way that would avoid consumers having to pay excessive bills. What we've done is to ensure, actually to ensure that they are using the fuel efficiently. So what we did a couple of years ago was to introduce um, a heat rate determinant where it goes beyond a certain threshold, they will have um, to retain some of those costs associated with that. So it will benefit them to have an efficiently operating plant so that it can keep fuel um, use as low as possible. After Lee Akishi explained that apart from an application for a basic rate increase, the Barbados Light and Power Company had also sought the FTC's approval to employ fuel hedging. She said the Commission has sanctioned the hedging with certain constraints and the company has appealed at least one of those conditions, a matter that's now under consideration by the FTC. In the meantime, the Commission's chief executive says the utility regulator is pushing ahead as best as it can in processing the application for the general rate hike requested by the Light and Power Company. What we are doing, we are addressing the application as is. Right. Um, the speed with which we make a determination <laughs> will impact the overall rate. But fuel as it stands, which is the critical thing, regardless of whether we make a determination now, mm -hmm. the, the, we are not required under this application to make any determinations relative to fuel cost. Fuel as it stands now is a complete pass through the customers. So whether it is um, $70 per barrel or $80 per barrel, that will continue to be passed through the customers. The commission has no remit in terms of setting fuel prices. That is set on the international market, outside the complete ambit of the commission. Um, that is a negotiated position between BNOC, which is the importer of gas, and, and um, the off-taker, which should be lighter power. The BLMP is seeking rate hikes ranging from $2 to $6 more per month for domestic customers and between $4 and $10 more for general service users. I'm Emmanuel Joseph for Barbados Today. There's regional and international news after this short break. New Brunswick sardine fillets, boneless, ready to eat. Perfect, son. Hold on, hold on, one more. It is sardine. Well, let's see. And available in bold new flavors. Brunswick Sardine Fillets are giving sardines a new vibe. More oxygen means more energy, means more adventure. Cure Oxygen, natural spring water infused with more oxygen to improve your energy, immunity and performance. The next generation of hydration. Cure Oxygen. Nature's ultimate water. To news from the region, the Grenada government says it intends to remove all remaining measures put in place to curb the spread of COVID-19 in early April. More from GBN News. Health Minister Nicholas Steele says April 4th is the date they have set for Grenada to return to some form of normality as the remaining restrictions will be lifted. The state of emergency, vaccine differentiation and the mask magnets, Minister Steele has confirmed should be no more. The state of emergency only remains to date to assist in the enforcement of uh, these regulations. They exist within the, the state of emergency or, and as well as the, the Public Health Act. Um, so, no, the intention is between now and the 4th of April, 
that the state of emergency would be removed. Steele, however, warned that the onus is on Grenadians to practice personal responsibility during the period under review to ensure the regulations are removed. We will continue to monitor and analyze between now and then and even after that. Monitor and analyze the situation locally, regionally and globally and adjust accordingly. But Cabinet does believe, based on information received and consultation with our various uh, national, regional and international partners, that on April 4th, the, the vaccine differentiation and mask mandates can be removed. And finally, on the international front, United Nations humanitarians say almost one child per second in Ukraine is becoming a refugee of the war. This as the International Organization for Migration reports that the total number of people who have now fled the country since the Russian invasion began passed 3 million. Some 1.5 million children have now joined the exodus from Ukraine. Every day... Over the past 20 days in Ukraine, more than 70,000 children have become refugees. Okay, that's every minute 55 children fleeing the country. To give a sense of the border that I used to visit, the main border, Medak, Medyak, Poland to Ukraine, it is scores of people standing around buses and minivans calling out names of capital cities, or at least it was a week ago, and people getting onto those. The vast, vast majority, of course, are people with wonderful intentions and great generosity, but there is no doubt, given uh, what we understand of trafficking in Europe, and that, that that remains a very, very grave issue. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbidestoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.